Welcome to the Scaling Tech Podcast, where we help you manage your growing engineering team. Through expert interviews, we help you navigate the challenges of leading, hiring, growing, and nurturing your tech team to deliver the value your customers demand. Brought to you by agilityfeet.com, experts in staffing engineering teams in Latin America for clients globally. Agile itself puts the responsibility where it lies by putting the business people in the driver's seat for business decisions and the technical people in the driver's seat for technical decisions. And so the role of the Agile coach is to help the organization use Agile well to develop products that matter and along the way help the organization clear all the many things that will come up that are in the way of that delivery. Welcome to the Scaling Tech Podcast, the podcast for leaders of growing software engineering teams. I'm Aaron Syme, here with my co-host, David Alfaro. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing fine. Uh, it's a hot day in the tropic. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, I made the wrong decision to, to use this, this kind of shirt for, for today. It was, <laughs> I'm, 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 yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, but besides that, very nice. Pierce, thank you for asking. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I am. Uh, I am uh, deep in thought right now. I am processing this conversation that we just had with Lisa Adkins uh, today, and I think this is going to be one of those episodes of the Scaling Tech Podcast for for me that I go back to multiple times and listen to again uh, because this. I think I. I drew a lot out of this on a professional and a personal level and just the, the discussion of change management. It, it really goes beyond agile with Lisa, which is, I think, exactly the type of conversation you and I expected and why we were both looking forward to this conversation so much. I agree. I think Lisa is, is the rare kind of person uh, that is very useful to have in the society that, um, that that's to follow. She, it's, it seems to me that her journey started trying to help people and then she realized that she needed more skills but for to realize that she had to do the self awareness to one mm-hmm. level and then she managed that level and then she realized hmm i need i'm facing new challenges and ne- then she had to raise the awareness to the next level and so so for and, and she is very good at that she is very yeah. good at that so i, I think that is the beauty of the conversation we had is is the capacity to observe yourself and then observing yourself, observing yourself. I mean, that kind of uh, thing, uh, mm-hmm. it's very helpful for you, uh, for your mind, for <laughs> for your code, <laughs> yeah. for everything. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. I, I, I really recommend the show, really. Yeah, the absolutely. There's so many uh, Agile coaches, my, myself included, uh, in, in, in the past that, you know, come into coaching from a uh, engineering perspective and and I think someone like Lisa who has knowledge that goes the scope of that knowledge is so much larger than the technical practices and you know hey let's do a new type of project management and all those other dynamics that she brings into it I think are are so valuable and and uh, yeah and I just think we had a fantastic conversation with Lisa around that I really enjoyed it that's all good. right Let's Let's get get to our interview on Agile Coaching with Lisa Adkins. Lisa Adkins is a truly inspirational voice in the Agile community. She co-founded the Agile Coaching Institute in 2010 and has been a leader in working committees for IC Agile and the Scrum Alliance. She is author of Coaching Agile Teams, which is a foundational text for anyone interested in Agile Coaching. Welcome to the Scaling Tech Podcast, Lisa. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Well, thanks for saying I'm inspirational. That inspires me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, no, I think you have been truly inspirational for both David and I early in our careers. So, no, this is a real pleasure for us to have you on the podcast. Thanks for taking the time. You bet. Uh, let's start, uh, if I may, with just kind of a definition of agile coaching for our listeners. What does an agile coach do? Um, well, that depends on who you're answering that question to, honestly, <laughs> um, because the as you mentioned in the in the introduction here, agile coaching is a proper profession now with learning objectives, competencies, code of ethics, standards of the profession, those sorts of things. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know everyone who professes to be an agile coach is working within all that and is up to that, that standard. And also, um, how an agile coach 
interacts with people in organizations is different depending on their role and what they care about. So, um, so what I say is different. So what audience would I be talking to, Aaron, when I'm answering this question, what is an agile coach? Uh, well, in our, in our case, our listeners are generally engineering managers leading growing development teams. So a, a technical audience on the engineering side of, of, of the company, um, you know, who's obviously a key part of many, many scrum teams, uh, but a combination of engineers and engineering leaders. Okay. So for engineers and engineering leaders, I think the important thing to know about agile coaching is that um, it helps teams and organizations connect the delivery mechanism, the people, the teams with the business <clears throat> and intent mechanism um, and gets the engineering manager out of the middle of that work. It actually puts the responsibility where it lies. Agile itself puts the responsibility where it lies by putting the business people in the driver's seat for business decisions and the technical people in the driver's seat for technical decisions. And so the role of the Agile coach is to help the organization use Agile well to develop products that matter and along the way, help the organization clear all the many things that will come up that are in the way of that delivery. Excellent. There you go. That's well, one possibility. <laughs> no, that sounds great. And I think we'll be uh, music to the ears of many uh, engineering managers uh, to hear that the tech decisions lie with the tech team, uh, for sure. That's certainly one aspect of agile methods, I think, that have always been attracting to, attractive to engineering teams is, is the idea of having you know a more clear voice in there, but also understanding, I think, one of the interesting challenges of being an agile coach is, is um, helping the team balance that with customer priorities and business priorities and seeing the value of that, which uh, it's an area of, I think, a lot of uh, interesting discussion, sometimes even contention when you're thinking about things like user stories and Oh, backlogs. yeah, for sure. Yeah, of course, lots of contention and rightfully so, because mm -hmm. we cannot do everything we want to do. Our eyes are always bigger than our stomachs and we put too much work in progress into organizations. And so what not only does this help the engineering managers get out of the middle of being the voice of tech decisions or the old, the sole decider of tech decisions, it also gets the engineering manager out of the middle of being the go-between between, between technology and business, and being in the in the um, uncomfortable and not appropriate position of sort of speaking for the business, making some of those decisions just to keep the team running because the business isn't available. So what Agile does is, is creates this bridge between business and IT or delivery in general, it doesn't always have to be software, it could be anything, um, creates this bridge that allows people to be in constant progress motion and doing it in small bites so that we know we're developing the thing that people care about, not the thing they told us about weeks or months or a year ago. And so that's, I think that's an important point is that Agile itself creates this sort of safety for change. Um, and the other thing that's important to note is that Agile runs on a different um, mindset operating system than the ways we have worked in the past. Completely different belief system, even, if you will. So that's another piece of the Agile Coach's role, is while the Agile Coach is helping people use the structures of Agile well to deliver and help the organization get out of its own way, you know, the business decisions that five years, 10 years ago seem like good ones that are now in the way. Um, in order to do that, the Agile Coach is helping to instill this completely new version of an internal operating system inside of the people so that they can work from a, uh, from a more of a complexity standpoint and a values-oriented standpoint that'll hold them better than simple rules and procedures and um, do this, if then, else, which works really well in software, I guess, still, kind of, but not so much <laughs> for most business decisions. Right. Lisa, when uh, uh, something I've noticed with you and I always admired is your very automatic, but very well executed ability to set the frame, <laughs> to set the, the coaching frame. Uh, when you initiate hand interaction, I've seen that it is, it is very, it's very nice to see. 
I mean, it is a nice uh, uh, lesson for me always. The question I have is, before you engage an organization, and that means that you are you have some certainty that you can help that organization. And one, one re requisite, of course, is the, uh, the self-awareness the people in, inside or, or the decision makers there could have. So they realize they have a problem and they recognize you as a, as a, as a person that could help navigate the situation they, they have or they are. But it's still the process of qualifying that organization as it is ready for you. It is, it is, is this organization at the right moment in the right circumstances so they can be coached <laughs> and you can yeah. help them? What, what's that qualification process? Yeah. Well, there's sort of two contexts that I work in. One is as um, an expert in the agile field, an expert in future of work methods in general. And the other is as um, an expert in human system dynamics and, um, and relationship systems. Um, and I tend to do that work more with leadership teams. So the, the qualification process you're talking about is quite similar. Basically, um, the, the telltale sign I'm looking for is do they have a vision for the change they want to make? Like, why is this change they want to make important to them? And is it a vision that's grounded in something that will sort of pull them forward through the hard times? So for some um, leadership teams, for some organizations, that, that why, the answer to that why has to be grounded in business metrics and levers we want to pull and changes we want to see and these statistics by this certain time, because that's how that organization thinks. Some organizations, it could be that they want to be pulled forward by creating greater capacities in their organizations, greater capabilities among their people. So either of those could be good opportunities. Now, the next step beyond the why. So by the way, a lot of, a lot of people, when they engage with me, have no clue what their why is, none whatsoever. And so I know right up from the beginning that unless I can help them contact that why inside themselves and that why is shared enough among the people who need to be involved, that, that we need to work on the why before anything else. Um, because these I mentioned that Agile runs on this different operating system, right? So that means that all of us human beings are going through an upgrade process, which is just not as simple as you know upgrading software is today. Think about how hard it was to upgrade operating systems back in the 1990s. It's more like that. It's pretty darn clunky, you know. And it's and 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 Agile is this new app that runs on these modern operating systems, but we we install it on top of this old operating system, and it runs sort of clunky, and we don't know why, right? And so, so the once we have a sense of why enough to pull people forward through that internal operating system upgrade, then I have to ask myself the question, can I align with what's trying to happen in the organization? And that is just some deep inner work of really, really listening, not, not only to what people say, but to what they don't say, to where the organization, I, where I assess the organization is headed. It's, it's what some people will call guesswork and, and it's what I call inner wisdom. And so I tap into my inner wisdom and say, can I align with what's actually trying to happen in this organization? If so, I might be a good match. Um, so David, you were talking about self-awareness and your, uh, your proposition was that there must be a good amount of self-awareness in the organization to know that they need what I bring. Um, I would say that good amount of self-awareness starts with me. You know, like, not just, oh, is this interesting and cool? Or, oh, I'm so flattered they're asking. But more of like, how can I actually be of service in this situation? And if I can't align with what's trying to happen or it's not clear enough, then it's not the right time to engage. Because the work I do is really long-term sustainable changes in people and organizations. And so, um, 
And so they don't necessarily have to be ready for that. There's like, there's not a whole checklist of things that they have to, you know, hurdles they have to jump before I can engage with them. But we have to be ready to move together through uncertainty and use the things we know about modern ways of working to metabolize all that uncertainty, to deal with all that change and come out better on the other side. All right. So basically what you're saying, try, let me repeat back briefly, is that uh, the, the, the organization of the decision makers in this case should have a clear why why and what and what's the end goal right and and you and you should see a connection between the end goal and the why uh or or a process where you can go from the why to the end goal and the other thing and and, and, and sensing and i like this very much is you are you are very interested in in assess the values of the other i mean of of the decision makers you want to see if those values align with you and that that exploration, I think, what you have described is is wonderful. I love mm. it. Very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there would be one little tweak I I make to what you said. I don't even think I care if they know what the what is. I care if they know what their why is, because the what is going to emerge over time. This is one of the most beautiful things. Now, now they'll think they know the what. Nine times out of ten, <laughs> they think they know what they're trying to do. Um, and if we focused only on that, we would probably be missing so many different opportunities to have, you know, something truly unique and new and novel emerge that matches the conditions they're dealing with much better, you know, when they're guided by their why versus focus so much on the what. But well, that, oh, oh, that's a good oh, point. You know that's a good point. Yeah. And I'm going to backtrack a little bit because I did talk about metrics. And so for some organizations, the way they sort of back into their why is through a bunch of what's that seem like they're scientific. They have numbers. Um, they're actually not any more scientific than anything else or even reliable than anything else, but they feel more tangible. And, you know, if, if that's the safety blanket that's needed, great. Great. Um, as long as there is a compelling why that will pull for to pull the whole group forward through, you know, whatever changes come to those numbers, those what's, those metrics they've created, they think they need. That's great. In other words, as long as they are not an uh, obstacle for you to <laughs> to move forward with the with the organization, right? Is you know, I mean, it's and, fine. It's fine for them to have that. I, it's okay. Well, and if they and if they are a quote unquote obstacle, that's just what's trying to happen. So often, um, the the level of work I do with with organizations, leadership teams, with with teams across organizations, I often become the scapegoat. Sometimes the only thing people can align on is like she's not doing a very good job. Okay, fine. I mean, that's just what is happening in that human system right now. And, um, and there have definitely been times that I've backed away saying, all right, so for what you're going for right now, I don't think I can be of service, but you'll know when to re-engage me when this and this and this happen, or when you start to notice these things, or I, I'll engage them in a conversation. When is it time to re-engage me? Right, right. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful mm -hmm. answer. Yeah, I think this is, this is so interesting, and this really gets to the, the heart of... Um, what I think is so interesting about your work, Lisa, and, and that I think definitely impacted my uh, career as uh, as an agile coach early on, and that, but but really more more importantly has carried through into my uh, leadership style at this point. Even though I'm not a coach anymore, at least I hope it's carried through into my leadership style. I should say, uh, and, of course, and that's this <laughs> that's this uh, this human element of of coaching and you know kind of the what versus the why when when I started um, in, indulge me in a, in a in a short story here uh, when I started in uh, agile coaching I came from it very much from a engineering background a software development background and 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 my mindset was you know, why was I attracted to Agile? It was because, well, it was obviously better. Like people were working more productively, people were happier. And so I, I was, especially coming from 
that sort of mindset. It was kind of like, well, as an agile coach, this is great because all I have to do is convince someone that they'll get work done faster. The metrics will make it obvious. Uh, and then why wouldn't they do this? It's easy, right? I, you know, it's like a very simple, like, uh, mm -hmm scientific almost approach, I'll say, but it completely ignored the human element of it, which is that change is hard. And there's so much more to adopting change than just knowing that it's going to be good for you eventually. Um, and and so an, an element where, uh, or a uh, thing that happened to me as a coach was I was I was working in a in a Fortune 500 organization as a coach ar around multiple teams. And uh, there was a uh, gentleman in that organization who had been a project manager previously in, in, a, in the very previously traditionally run. Uh, when they started this Agile group, uh, it was, of course, a very exciting thing. And they asked people to volunteer to work in it. He had volunteered to become a scrum master in that organization. So he really wanted to be there. He really wanted to do the work. But it was a difficult mindset change for him to move from being a... a um, uh, a, a task assigner type of project manager to being a servant leader type of scrum master. And he wanted to do it so much, but it was, it was hard for him. And, and I was struggling, I think, with how to, how to coach him through that, because to me it was just, well, you know, the, the methods work better. So just do it. Right. <laughs> it was, I wasn't thinking about how hard it was for him. And there was a day where, you know, we were talking and, and he literally, uh, broke down uh, emotionally with me uh, talking about it. And I had this sort of, you know, the the record scratch out of body moment where I'm looking at myself and thinking, oh my goodness, engineering school did not prepare me for this moment at all. I, I What am I doing? <laughs> and I realized, you know, there's this whole other huge aspect to coaching that I just didn't know that much about and was not prepared for to, to really effectively help not only this one individual, but, you know, that organization through it. And so that was about the time I started working with Michael Spade and and with you at the Agile Coaching Institute and, and really got um, exposed to much more of that human element of it. And it was tremendously helpful to me in, in my coaching career. But like I said, I think more importantly, later on, as uh, just as a leader in general and, and, um, and, you know, hopefully giving me some of the empathy that certainly engineering school did not. So I, I, you know, to me, that's, that's kind of this what versus why, right? The, you know, I was thinking initially as a coach purely around what we needed to be more productive. We needed to work on the right things, the what's, but not really the why's. Uh, and I think that is, I think that's just really, really hard for a lot of people to even recognize um, that that's necessary. So yeah, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that kind of human element of coaching and and, um, and that was my long-winded way of saying thank you for exposing me to it. <laughs> well, I am I'm just sitting here reveling in the joy of your story. And so, and so happy that um, you feel like it's pulled through to your leadership. Because you know, one, one of the things I often say to people is that, um, you know, agile coaches are leaders. Plain and simple. I, honestly, I hold that everyone in an organization these days is a leader. At the very least, we're called to lead our own lives, you know, and and that's a fairly recent innovation if you think about it. You know, my grandfather working on the General Motors assembly line certainly was not called to lead his own life at work. You know, right. he was called to do the same job, you know, for an eight-hour, 12-hour shift every single day, right? So, <clears throat> so we're all getting used to this sort of new world where where our personal goals and our personal whys matter, where, um, where the way we show up at work and at home is really all one thing. And, and, how, and how do the two interact and interplay with each other? And where changes happen in an organization that we didn't ask for, we don't necessarily want, they're going to impact the way we do business um, in the way our daily life at work happens tremendously. And then what do we do about it? You know, so the human element you're talking about is simply came about because in my own agile coaching work, I noticed, you know, I kind of sort of approached it a lot like you, Aaron, you know, what's well, just a process, like just do this new process. Isn't it better? You know, it's so great. Look what happens. We're developing like real product every, you know, at that, at that time it was every four weeks. Now it could be every two weeks or every, you know, two hours, you know, we're developing real product. It was amazing. 
Um, and then I noticed that if a change did not happen inside the people, if those people did not confront the identity crisis that Agile brings on for so many, that as soon as the winds of, of, of fate sort of shifted in the organization and the attention was taken off of Agile, people would go right back to the, sort of these contracted ways of working where they started to not assert their opinion as much. They started to wait to be told what to do again. And oftentimes this could even be in, you know, cloaked under something called Agile, but wasn't anymore. And so, you know, if I wanted my impact to be more sustainable, that's where I realized, wow, I have a hole in my own skill set. And so that's where I went to go learn about professional coaching skills and facilitation skills. And then Aaron, you and others came along and got to benefit from that. And now you're passing that on to other people. And so that's the virtuous cycle that we're in. Um, and we're basically in this era where, um, where every human's thought, patterns, opinions, experiences, options, ideas, they all matter because we are not in the cut and dried world of the 1950s General Motors assembly line anymore. Mm -hmm. Or even the 1990s or the, or the 2000s. (laughs) Things are changing fast. Yeah, I think there are places like that, but by and large, the sort of people who are listening to us right now, like, you know, just, I'll just speak to you all directly. Think about it right now. Like how much change have you experienced in the last five years? So I'm not even saying like the last two years, not just the COVID years, but you know, a few years prior to that, how much change have you experienced in your work, in your life, with your family? with the organizations you're involved in that matter to you outside of work and all that, like how much has actually changed? And for most people, when they, when they stop to think about it, they're like, oh my gosh, it's been not only a lot, but it's been on all those fronts at once. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, it has. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. There's a, a, a phrase you've, I've seen you uh, talk a little bit about this, like an edge theory of change, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I mean, it, it does, things have changed in, in so many aspects at once. And certainly what I have seen and what I've tried to teach myself to, to do is, is to adapt to that change, right? Because those are the people who are, who are thriving professionally and personally through, through these, these very, very complicated changing times. Um, and, uh, but that's not an easy skill to, re- to get, right? And I think, honestly, I think, you know, having that agile coaching background helped, has helped me to get through those things more by making me less of a fixed mindset person, perhaps. But, um, yeah, what, um, I mean, how, how would you recommend, uh, an engineering manager, maybe who does not have an agile coaching background to help lead their teams through all of this? simultaneous change on so many fronts. Yeah. Well, let's let's approach that from two aspects. Um, one is the edge theory of change that you just mentioned a moment ago. And the other is the safety that Agile gives us to change. Okay. So um, real brief thing in a nutshell, the edge theory of change um, was popularized in the coaching world by um, the organization and relationship systems coaching school. Um, and it comes from deeper work that was done by Arnold Mendel, who's a Jungian analyst and a quantum physicist. Get that combination. <laughs> That's a great amazing combo. Amazing guy, <laughs> amazing guy, who, um, who helped initiate something called process-oriented psychology. And so the, the bottom line of edge theory is just imagine that there's this sort of this edge, there's this carrot, like the top of a mountain, right? And on one side of this mountain is what's familiar and comfortable to people. And so let's use your example earlier, Aaron, the, the guy who, um, was just more comfortable, uh, giving out tasks. That was what he knew. That was what he knew how to do. Uh, I'll bet you he felt a lot of value from being the guy who knew who was doing what, when, and how it all fit together. I mean, um, and I'm sure he was like super smart that way. I'm sure he could put the pieces together in his head. And maybe he was the only one who had all the pieces together. I mean, so like, so think about the sort of level of 
feeling safe and like my identity matters. I value, I'm valued because I can do those things, right? Yeah. So that's what's familiar to that person. What's on the other side of that edge is what's emerging. It's not quite here yet, but you can sort of glimpse it. And so he could glimpse that there was this agile thing and, oh my gosh, look at this. If we use this agile framework, I don't have to tell anyone what to do. They can, they can not only assign tasks to one another, people can volunteer for tasks and look how amazing that is because then they really want to do the work, you know? And so although that's all great and everything, as the person sort of climbs up toward that edge at the top of that mountain, they look over and they're like, Ooh, I like it. And they might even go over there and try it a bit like this engineering manager did. And then they're like, so, huh, if I'm not telling everyone what to do all day long, then what is my value? And as soon as a thought like that occurs, boop, back to the other side of the edge they go, right? And so this is really normal, to, it's called zigzagging over the edge, really normal to try out the new behavior. You know, something happens, a minor freak out, you go back to the other side. And so for people who don't have a background in agile coaching or coaching in general, you know, those engineering managers out there that are wanting to help people when they see them, you know, sort of pop back to the old behavior, um, the first thing to do and this comes to us from CRR Global, the Organization and Relationship Systems Coaching people, the first thing to do is what's called honor the familiar. Talk to people about like, how great is it? And, or how great was it when you knew exactly everything that was going on? You know, how, you know, what did you love about being in the middle of all of it? You know, just allow them to contact what was good and right and useful, or at least what they appreciated about what's called the familiar, right? And if you if you do that, nine times out of 10, what's gonna come out of their mouth is, yeah, that was great, but you know, I was really exhausted. You know, like I was in the middle of everything, I could never take any time off. And when they do that, that's an opening that you drive a truck through. And the <laughs> truck you're gonna drive through that opening is, yeah, you're right, that is a downfall. So let's talk about what you've been experiencing with this newer way of working and how it helps you with that, right? So now you're connecting it to what matters to them. You know, the, the thing that they've now realized was unsustainable in the old way of working, even though it's more familiar, more comfortable, right? And then you just help them craft a little experiment, you know? So like, all right, so you know, uh, next week, probably the VP is going to come and ask you a question and you're going to be like, I, I don't know, the team knows that. And you might feel really uncomfortable and you might want to go back to the side of the familiar. So let's just play it out in our minds. How do you want to show up when you're asked that question and it's no longer you that knows the answer? You know, just help them craft, like that's just a little example. Who knows what their experiment would be, but help them craft a little experiment for themselves that they can run to just make the, the ability to be on the other side, the emerging side, a little more solid, a little more solid. And then of course, what will happen is that they will zigzag back to the familiar because, you know, they're going to get caught by that VP in, in, the, in a meeting. It's going to be deer in headlights. They're going to feel like they should have had the answer and they don't. Of course, that VP is operating from an old operating system too, right? And right. so like <laughs> all of this is related, you know? And so just basically support people in their freak out and support people in, in dealing with the identity crises that modern ways of working, of which Agile is one, tend to bring about. Interesting. Oh, uh, I really like that. Uh, I, I like that a lot. Um, it, yeah, I think I it's always it really effective, uh, mm -hmm. effective to try and talk to someone from their perspective, the things that they value, yeah. and then work from that starting point. Uh, go ahead, David. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, all this made of being enjoying every single word. And in all this conversation, I think what is an assumption is the, the the person and and you say that Harry by the way is is <laughs> i'm repeating is that the person wants to make understand the change i mean understand that something has to change but 
and the has is the is a poison part of the of that sentence you you i mean in order for you to actually do it you have to be convinced that doing that corresponds to achieving a value in the future and uh, and that is so powerful and makes me think of how do you do or yeah what are your experiences when someone hasn't made that important integration is like someone that said i am fine <laughs> don't mess with me because i think I, I think that you've been in organizations where uh, you, you find resistance. Oh, for sure. And, right. So, so how, how do you do with those pockets of resistance? <laughs> uh, well, the, the worst thing you can do when resistance is in the air is to resist the resistance. The very worst thing you can do is to try to convince, to try to push, to try to cajole. So think about this. Like when you're resisting something, I mean, for me, it's like unloading the dishwasher. I resist unloading the dishwasher all the time. Simple, simple situation, right? I gotta tell you, the last thing I need is my husband telling me a more efficient way to unload the dishwasher, right? So it, it's if, if you meet other people's resistance with your resistance, with your sort of pushing, you're pushing against each other. And what happens is if you relax your resistance to their resistance, they have to come toward you. They have to, right? And so you take up the topic of resistance itself. So you would name it. You'd say, so here's the deal. There's just a lot of resistance here. And that's okay because resistance is actually telling us a lot about what's going on. And so you just go into the nature of their resistance. Like, what's the worst thing you hate about this? You know, what's the experience you're afraid of repeating? You know, again, you're entering their familiar territory first because people are not going to let you usher them into a new way until they know that you honor the familiar, right? And so, you know, that may open up the same sort of pattern. They may be talking about the resistance and all of a sudden talk about, yeah, but you know, um, this agile thing has been better in this certain way. Okay, again, drive a truck through that, see if that takes them somewhere. But you know, there, there definitely comes a time where um, sort of no matter what you do, they're not moving. They're just not moving. And in that case, um, a strategy is to um, help them figure out how they're going to survive while agile or whatever the change is, is in the, is in their environment. You know? So I might say something like, let's just presume it's agile. Let's presume it's the same engineering manager, right? That Aaron was talking about before. So I try a couple different things. There's just a lot of resistance. This is, this is a classic thing that people will say to me. I don't understand what you just said. Could you say it in different words? All right, that's a classic, like, oh, I'm getting a little resistance here. Because, you know, by the second or third time someone says that to you, it's not the words you're saying that are the problem. So, you know, at that point, I might say something like, you know, look, it sounds like you're not ready to move over to this new way of working. Fair enough. I mean, you're in charge. You're in charge of every single edge you crossed and not, not every edge has to be crossed. Maybe I've done a little, you know, edge theory education, tiny little bit. They don't say something like, okay, so cool. What you don't get to choose is the fact that Agile is in the environment and that people are being asked to work in different ways. So how do you want to sort of arrange your relationship with Agile, number one, so that you survive, and number two, so that you don't hinder other people? And then let them do the work. Let them answer that question to do the work because it has to be personal to them. You can't tell them what to do. Uh, that's, that's requires a lot of thought. Uh, I'm, I'm absorbing that. Um, <laughs> Cause well, I think well, that's actually, such wonderful it requires, it really timeline requires, there. It requires more practice than thought. 
It really does. Yeah. It's just practice. It's just practicing this pattern. It's no different than um, you know a pattern for how we do check-ins or a pattern in code. It's no different than anything else. It's just in the human domain instead of the code domain. Right, right. I mean, the, the important thing here is that you cannot force a mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. However, and and it, as something that I'm hearing from Lisa is it, it relates very well with uh, when you find someone that has given up reason and is taking refuge in in the emotions uh, because they are comf comfortable and they, they feel safe there. And something that I do it is it is something like that. Lisa is like, okay. Can we recognize at least? I mean, I won't push you at all. I, I respect that. Um, but can we at least recognize that you're being intentional doing this? I mean, what is, I mean, let's, let's define the situation. And I let you sinking. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but, but let's describe what is going on, what, it's, what is the environment telling me, what is the facts. What are the facts telling me? Uh, okay, these are these are the facts. Uh, I led you there <laughs> with that, <laughs> and I'll be here <laughs> when you're ready to come back and, yeah, and, yeah, and talk yeah. about this, right? Yeah. So what you're doing is a skill called naming what's going on. Right. Okay. And it's a really powerful place to be. Most people spend all their time talking about content. And they try to convince each other by having more um, salient arguments about this way is better than that way or this approach and that approach. And they stay here in sort of this back and forth all the time. It's possible to, to take a meta pattern view of that and say, okay, so what's been happening in this conversation is we keep going back and forth and we're not actually going forward. You know, so that's naming it. That's naming the pattern, the meta pattern that's happening. And then you see what people say about that. It's a totally different place to look. People are not used to looking here, but it's the place that uh, communication, collaboration, creativity, choice making, change, it's the place where all of those competencies um, arise from, is looking at the patterns of how we do those things together. Not just sort of the case law of how we've gone through all these different decisions in the past. Right. The 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 awareness of the awareness I'm executing in the situation. That the third four level of awareness is key. Yeah, <laughs> Imagine. yeah. In, yeah and the, navigating the world. Yeah. But you know, once you're I mean, I, I think people in technology are amazing at spotting patterns absolutely amazing at it, right? So once you turn them on to the fact that, oh, you can pay attention to patterns at this level too, they can see them for sure. They, they, all, they already know them viscerally, right? We all, we all know what these patterns feel like, right? So now it's just being able to take something that's inside of one's body and just like pull it out as an object and be able to look at it and like, oh yeah, look at that pattern. That's what we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At some point, at some point, I remember a, a tool that was very helpful for me. I mean, uh, fifteen years ago, uh, it was uh, at some conference, some some video I saw of you, uh, where you said that if you were in a team and you and you as a leader wanted to enact the change, I, I mean, you see the change, you see the other side of the bridge clearly by the rest of the team they i mean the team doesn't i mean they don't see anything <laughs> they uh, still they are uh, digesting and suffering and complaining about the situation they are uh something that works very well and, and, and it is a very change tool is what about an experiment so Let's do the experiment. It doesn't, and and the moment uh, I remember this, the moment we use the word experiment, poof, mm -hmm. the resistance disappears. <laughs> like, well, 
Except that since I said that, the word experiment has gotten a bad rap. I've been told recently by two different clients, don't say experiment with our leadership team. They're allergic right. to experiments, you know. Right. So, but you know, whatever the, it, that's just because people are just so wanting things to be certain and straightforward. And, you know, I mean, don't you want that? I, boy, I tell you, I'd like a little more of that in my life. Here's the bad sure. news. Can you come in? <laughs> it's not coming. You know, we talked about change earlier and, and the couple of folks um, who I'm forgetting their names, Anil Chima and someone else who wrote something in Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago about the nature of change itself. And they, they said the most amazing and horrifying thing. They said that change is pervasive, persistent and exponential. And this is new. This is new. We've always had change, right? But we haven't had change that was pervasive, meaning we talked about earlier, happening in multiple parts of our work and life at the same time. Um, persistent, meaning happening all the time. We don't get to get off the change bus. And worse than that, exponential. So like if we think the pace of change is fast now, we've seen nothing yet. Um, and another way of saying that, a horrible way of saying that is today is the slowest change will ever be in your life. So, you know, when we're faced with those sorts of things, anything we can do to help people face what is true right now and work with it without freaking out, which is, oh, back to the safety and agile, which I don't think I got to that second part of some answer I was giving before it was edge theory and right. safety of agile. Well, here we go, folks. Safety of agile. All right. Woo woo. All right. So. So, you know, if we're not able to get off the change bus and the rate at which change is going to come is going to continue to accelerate, then, then the new skill set we have is to metabolize change. In other words, you know, like, we, like we do with food, to take it in, to get the nutrients out of it and let the waste go, you know. And so if we're going to metabolize change, I love Agile and future of work ways of working because the safety they give us is to have a vision, have that why, like you're talking about, David, have that why, but not necessarily know all the steps to get there. And if we did, we'd be fooling ourselves anyway. And then to ask the question, like, what, what are the highest business value things we could do now? And then just do some of them and actually completely do them, make progress. And when we make progress within a certain period of time, a short period of time, then where we've got that piece done, it's out there hopefully producing value in the world, then we can let in all that change that's happened in the last few weeks. And we can ask the question again, what's the highest business value thing to do now? Okay, now let's do that. And so Agile makes it safe to metabolize all this change because it creates this suspension inside the time box of a sprint or an iteration or a release, whatever sort of frame you're working in, it creates a suspension where you're actually allowed to deliver what you said you were going to deliver. And all that change that's churning out there in the world just churns, it just churns, there's all kinds of stuff going on and it's not let in during this time. That's why it's safe to deliver now. And then we let it in and then we deliver the next thing. So that's one way that there's safety in Agile. And the other way that there's safety is through the these constant feedback loops. So the daily stand-up is one, the sprint review is another, the retrospective is another. These are times for us to rely on one another and to ask ourselves the question, how could we better rely on one another to deliver what we're trying to deliver and to metabolize all the change that's coming in each iteration. Well, I, I, I think that the, the psychological message here is, is change is here to stay and is going to be more pervasive and more exponential. So brace yourself. But the, 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 I think that the positive addition to that is, but guess what? You are more than capable to deal with it. In, in fact, you can master it. <laughs> In fact, you can you can welcome it in your life, and, and you'll be better off. Yeah, yeah. I wish um, I wish for more of us to sink ourselves into that mindset that you just said, David, mm -hmm. because the so much of what we're experiencing now is the resistance to the changes that are coming that are causing all kinds of 
additional turbulence on top of the turbulence caused by the change itself that that's the one we can't control at all all this internal turbulence we can totally control in fact it's the only thing we really have control over <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, well, profound <laughs> words. Well, I'm taking, I'm taking it's, it's, professional and personal right. advice from this conversation the, the, for the, sure. The, the, <laughs> the interesting thing is, 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 is the Stoics who say take that, take control of that internal turbulence because while you're, while you're wasting emotions <laughs> in all the turbulence that you can control, right? So, uh, uh, and I think beyond me being agreeing or not to the Stoics is that. Uh, the, again, the positive thing is that it's possible. Right? <laughs> that internal, that internal turbulence. You are the best. The, you are the best person in the world capable to deal with that turbulence. No other person is more capable than you to, to do, and it is possible. And I like that. I think agile. Uh, I fell in love with agile because it it. Agile implicitly, it is based on the idea on the magnificence of the human mind. Mm -hmm. Is that it is it is anti fragile <laughs> that that uh, sorry um, that the mind is capable to resist, to learn, to adapt, and become stronger with change. And that assumption that is is the foundation of the agile movement is so powerful still. I mean, because it's true and it. It is an ovation, an standing ovation to the human mind, I think. Well, that's a beautiful note to end on, if I may, David. Um, we're, we're running out of time here. Um, <laughs> but it, and it saddens me so much to say that because this really has been a wonderful conversation, Lisa. I really hope that we can do this again. Um, I'd love to. Th this has just been great. There's there's so many other things I'd love to discuss with you. And, and uh, thank you again for taking the time to speak with David and I today. Um, where can uh, people learn more about your work? You know, everything is in one place on my website on lisaatkins.com, but you have to know what my parents did to me with the spelling of my first name. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll find it on L-Y-S-S-A-A-D-K-I-N-S.com. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again so much, Lisa. Really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, I did too. Thanks. I, um, I found myself saying some things in novel ways in this conversation. And that's how I know it's been a good one. It's, gener it's been generative. It's pulled in some new things. And I'll be thinking about this for a little while yet. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Scaling Tech Podcast where we help you manage your growing engineering team. Brought to you by agilityfeet.com, experts in staffing engineering teams in Latin America for clients globally. For more information on today's episode and to submit your ideas for future guests, please visit scalingtechpod.com.